Forty percent of the Alaska state budget goes to educating Alaska youth, and much of that is used in Bush, Alaska. The process of educating natives living in rural areas has always been a challenge to educators, and today schools are being built under a multi-million dollar program. This effort is coupled to one of the most extensive telecommunication networks in the world, with students learning from computers. This puts some Alaska schools on the leading edge of the 21st century and utilizes some of the same technology that put man on the moon. One. We have a liftoff. A familiar name that has become synonymous with Alaska's education system is Molly Hooch. Who is this woman and how did she become so famous? which we signed a piece of paper saying we went to high school in our town. And I, what I figured to be is that down in June or wherever they did it, they put all the names in a barrel, so to speak. And they picked out a name to represent the filing suit. And it happened to be my name. That suit filed in Molly's name was partially responsible for the most ambitious school expansion program the state has ever seen. Filed in the early 70s, before the Alaska Supreme Court, it argued that village high school students had the right to attend high school in their home village. But the filing of this suit did not create the awareness within the Department of Education of the need for local high schools. They were already in the process of creating smaller, more local school districts. Marshall Lind, Commissioner of Education. The hooch matter or the provision of secondary educational programs uh, was not a part of uh, the establishment of these separate districts. It just so happened that the implementation of Hooch, uh, all the new schools coincided with the implementation of these new districts. But what were all these changes supposed to accomplish, and how? Before we had a high school here, a bunch of kids had to go out to school and stay away from their families, which they didn't want in the first place, and they didn't have coming home before school was over with. And this way, with high schools in their own villages, they, they can stay home and finish high school. This new system of delivering education to rural Alaska established 21 new school districts. They're called the Regional Education Attendance Areas. These REAAs, or hooch sites, have 93 high schools, and getting the facilities ready and programs rolling has been a mammoth and costly project. Estimates range from 160 to 250 million dollars just for construction, with more money still required to complete all the buildings. Officials expected problems when the program was begun some due to the sheer magnitude of construction and others due to educational challenges but few expected problems from public criticism leading a charge to halt the installation of these schools is Anchorage Assemblyman Don Smith we're just not that wealthy that we can afford to just take care of every little nook and cranny of the state just because there happens to be somebody out there hunting or trapping or, or mining or whatever it might be Smith is circulating a petition around the state that demands a stop to the rural school construction it's the cost he and his supporters object to. This goes against the sentiment of many rural residents. People like Alfred Carmen. He lives in a village on the Kotzebue Sound. That's what's what uh, the feds and state monies are for, is for the kids to get educated. Besides the obvious desire to have children stay with their families, there is an equally deep desire by parents to have more control in their education. This is a new prospect for parents. To understand how important and how absent this has been in rural Alaska, you need a small dose of history. Before Captain Cook and Vitus Bering started the colonization of Alaska, the native peoples had their own methods of teaching. It was practical and effective. When a Clinkett boy was born, he was taken to his father. The father whispered in his ear over and over, My son, you are intelligent. You have great intelligence. My son, you are intelligent. You have great intelligence. It was the grandmother's job to teach the, the girls how to do beading, how to prepare food for winter, and how to patch things and do some artwork. And the most educated thing they were doing is telling stories, legend stories. The legend stories are the things that really happened to a, a Tlingit. Then came the Russians, who established the first Alaska school on Kodiak Island. The school admitted native children only with mixed blood, and if you attended, you could have owed the Russian-American company 15 years service, or put yourself in the cloth. Missionaries provided the next stage, 
but like the Russians, they had little regard for the cultures they were teaching. In 1867, control of Alaska education was in Washington, D.C. It took the U.S. 17 years to build just two schools. Even the territorial government was out of touch with its own backyard. Teachers felt it was easier to communicate with Washington than Sitka. White communities were growing in Alaska at the turn of the century, so Congress gave them authority to tax for schools. But schools for non-natives only. Washington was going to educate the natives. So enter a dual segregated educational system created by federal law. That law stated, this act shall be devoted to the education of white children and children of mixed blood who lead a civilized life. Eskimos and Indians shall remain under the control of the Secretary of Interior. So what is a civilized life? The territory attempted this explanation. A person should have turned aside former life habits, old associations, and exchanged old, barbaric, uncivilized environments for new and something unlike old life. The harsh cultural stripping that Alaska natives endured was not that long ago. Ida Katashan from Huna recalls her English lessons. We're not supposed to talk Klingit. If we talk Klingit, they punished us. Myself, they punished me lots of time. I'm not supposed to talk Klingit. Around the time of World War II, Alaska natives were being shipped outside to a high school in Chamawa, Oregon. The Bureau of Indian Affairs recognized the need for a closer school, and Mount Echkam in Sitka was established. It's the last and most well-known BIA boarding school. This federal institution shaped many native leaders and was a pattern the state attempted to repeat statewide, but was unsuccessful. This school offered native Alaskans a chance to see a different Alaska. Many saw their first tree here, first mountain, and they developed relationships with people from across the state. They've got a higher English level here than they do back home. And there's just more things to do here. <laughs> And I don't know, I've met people from all over the state of Alaska. Some places I never even heard of. <laughs> from Stevens Village, Tionic, and the Fairbanks, Anchorage, Juno, I think we got pride. We got school spirit. BIA boarding schools had made the first attempt at providing an education that would allow Native students a chance at competing in a rapidly encroaching white world but it did little to strengthen their heritage and allow a self-determination program through local input. They were sent thousands of miles from home, a haunting reality to families with a teenager. The departure of a daughter or son for nine months and the heartache was something very familiar to rural Alaskans. After Alaska became a state, its first major move in education was to build more dormitory high schools, and again with little or no village base, and still flying kids away. What was called the state-operated school system lasted only four years before SOS was abolished. Today, the establishment of village high schools is an attempt to bring education back to the village. It may be difficult for a child to have to leave home, but at the same time, that, that leaving home may, may in fact give them an opportunity to be a, you know, a real participant in, the, in today's world and not, you know, not a, a child that ends up with a seventh grade education and, and stays in the village and really contributes nothing to, to the state or to his, his people. You know, at some point, you have to take a look at the, the number of recipients as against the number of dollars that it's costing to do these things and, and uh, you know, maybe take another look at it. The greatest natural resource this state has is its, is its children, and I don't think you can pour too much money into uh, the development of, of children's minds and, and enabling them to become self-productive citizens. Um, also, Mark, going back a few years, I was uh, superintendent of the state's first uh, boarding school in Nome, the Belt School, and from that three years experience there, uh, I have to agree with, with the parents that the children should be at home. If you were given your choice, would you go out to, to school someplace else or stay here? Stay here. Why? It's 
my hometown and I grew up here. But do you think you might be able to learn something from some other place that you might not be able to learn here? I might, but then I think this will prepare me for my future when I plan to work here when I go out of high school. You plan to work here at the school or here in the village? Some place here in the village, maybe small business. What I'm so afraid we're going to do is we're going to spend a, conceivably a billion dollars and come back not too many years from now and say, gee, these kids aren't getting the kind of education that uh, the uh, Caucasian children in Anchorage are getting at West High. Uh, now what do we do? And then all of a sudden, the whole program is up and, and we're going to have to reinvent the wheel again. In 1975, the state began building high schools and villages across the state, and in Deering, people participated both in the development and construction of their new high school, bringing the idea of local control closer to reality. Today the Deering School is open, but it took two years longer than expected. Problems with water, sewage, and the delivery of materials were largely responsible. These problems plague construction projects throughout Bush, Alaska, and contribute to the high price tag of rural education. The buildings right there, the stands that cost $1.4 million. You know, a lot of people say that ain't a lot of money, but to us that's a lot of money you know, for one building. We're going to financially break the state in that concept, and I don't think we're going to do a thing for the people that are supposedly the recipients. I think somewhere there has to be a, you know, a, an analysis made of this, and, and uh, the majority is going to have to come back and get themselves into control again and take a look at what we're spending. Alaska Review did take a look at the cost of educating a young Alaskan, both in Anchorage and the Bush. The cost per student in a Bush high school is double that of an Anchorage pupil. The rural student costs the state $5,800 a year. An Anchorage student, 2900 Why does it cost so much for the Bush student? Rural Alaskans are quick to point out many factors that contribute to these high costs. In Kotzebue, for example, the price of electricity is triple that of Anchorage. And in more remote areas, the price of water and sewer service can be 25 times more than Anchorage. This all represents the single largest drain in Alaska's treasury. Out of a budget of $1.5 billion, education swallows $556 million. Bush education is expensive, but is it any more expensive than the former boarding home program? Dr. Drew the Climbfield. That the boarding home alternative was not working. Not only wasn't it working, but it wasn't cheap. These are the costs, and this is 1973. My guess is that things will have doubled if you did it again in 1979. As you can see, putting a kid in a dormitory costs the taxpayers $5,600 a year and it wasn't much cheaper to put them in a city home, over $3,000. This is not an inexpensive alternative. Boarding homes were expensive, but some paid a much higher price. This chart shows the rates of suicide of non-natives in Alaska and the rates of suicide of the native population. As you can see, the group that is most at risk are the young adults 
These are the 20 to 25 year olds. They're also mostly young men. When you have a society where the young men, as they enter adulthood, are committing suicides at these rates, there is something wrong with the type of education, with the type of developmental influences these young people have been receiving. If boarding schools are expensive and ineffective, are village high schools the solution? A widely publicized report was used by the press to question the success of Bush high schools. Dr. Ray Barnhart, who wrote the report, says these inferences were misleading. When the report was released and it indicated here are some of the problems that we see that need to be addressed in terms of uh, developing uh, adequate programs in these schools, uh, it, that was taken as an evaluative statement, which was not intended to be, only as an identification of some problems that need to be addressed. Uh, we went into the whole thing with the idea that small high schools were uh, a ne an important and necessary uh, step uh, for the state to take in the provision of secondary education, and that we were uh, responsible, uh, we were taking some responsibility for trying to help develop uh, curriculum models and cur uh, curriculum resource to help those schools uh, get through those formative years. Although Dr. Barnhart did not intend his report to be an evaluation, many took it as one. Well, I think the report was premature. Um, you can't uh, take a system and evaluate it after two years or two and a half years and, and have an effective evaluation. Secondly, the method of evaluation was simply having a number of basically teachers say what their feelings were. And in my opinion, it was simply a bitch session for teachers who'd been in the bush for several months and it was now winter time. Although Barnhart's report received criticism, it did address several problem areas widely recognized by rural educators, such as over-specialization of teachers, discipline, and teacher burnout. Some of it's due to uh, the living conditions, and some of it is due to um, the very difficult situation a teacher is in, in, in working with uh, children in a different culture and, and the language communications problems and the sheer frustration that you know, a teacher at best has a difficult job working with, with a number of individuals day in and day out and, and the tremendous amount of preparation and when you work with with children where you have a communications problem or there is a, a barrier uh, where the culture is different, where your housing conditions are, are not what you're used to in, in Anchorage or the lower 48. Uh, you have people who simply burn themselves out. They get tired quick. I think that, uh, I think that Discipline is always a problem in any school. I think what we require is more learned teachers in many ways. Uh, teachers who have, have read widely, um, who, who know about their own culture. The inability of a small village high school to offer all the specialized courses a larger school can is the major drawback in a rural education. The small staffs most of the Bush high schools have need support. Some of that support is technology. An experimental project has been helping instructor in their weak areas with computers. Well, I think technology is just breaking over the horizon in rural Alaska, uh, all over the state. And I say that because for the past year and a half, approximately two years, we've been involved in a, in a major experimental project using technology. And quite frankly, we're very, very excited about the potential for this. We're just in some of the early stages with parts of it. Uh, I'm speaking specifically of the Educational Telecommunications for Alaska program, a joint venture between the state and the federal government, uh, where we are using a variety of, uh, of uh, uh, technological items and, and approaches for both administrative purposes and uh, for instruction. And I, said, I think it is, uh, is going to have a significant impact, if used properly, by school districts in shaping how we design our educational programs, particularly in rural Alaska, for the next five to ten years. Technology can solve many of the problems faced by rural education, 
but many issues still remain. The degree in which the community controls its school and the relationship of the school to the community are still unresolved questions. Sometimes the issues become emotionally charged. Misunderstandings and hostility result. The school was shut down for the life and safety of the staff. When you have a parent saying he's going to kill someone, you have a problem when he is angry. We try to work with principal, and we can't. Was your life ever threatened? Yes, it was. Were you ever afraid that it could be taken? Yeah. Did you ever threaten the principal? Yeah, I did once. Um, it's hard for me to understand him as a violent student. You don't believe he's prone to violence? No, I don't. It's a difficult, difficult situation. It's a messy situation. A messy situation indeed. A situation involving violence, the struggle for local control, the suspension of the community school advisory board, and shaping influences a school or teacher can have on a village. The Kevalina Crisis, right here on Alaska Review.